everybody. I know you've all come from a great distance, from Desha, or perhaps uh, some of you may have come from Etzion Gaver in the along the uh, the the Red Sea. Uh, rumor has it that there is a Jewish community there from the time of Jeremiah. So I, I want to welcome you all to Tiberius. Tiberius, as you can see, it has really grown tremendously in the last 200 years since uh, Tiberius, uh, that uh, Roman scoundrel, don't tell anyone I said that, uh, since uh, Tiberius um, first built this city along uh, the Galilee. Well, I'm sure in your arduous travels, uh, my dear friends, you perhaps did not have a chance to catch up on the news from any of the town criers along your route. So uh, I will let you know what is, uh, what is happening uh, in this uh, year as we approach the first of Tishrei. Uh, in the year uh, 3711, uh, according to uh, the uh, calendar of creation, that um, Rabbi Yossi Bar Chalapta just established, uh, oh, not even um, uh, quite a uh, hundred years ago. Well, here's what's going on. I've heard it say that some uh, people consider this year 250, 250. CE. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, just so to give it a, a time frame uh, for you. Well, the Roman Empire has been suffering chronic political and military instability uh, in this era. Uh, there have been uh, endless civil wars and defeats at the hands of barbarians, and I do not know from week to week sometimes who is the emperor. Uh, the average reign of our sovereign has been no more than 18 months, and many for shorter periods of time. It seems that this is the problem, as far as I can tell, in my humble opinion. When there is a major war, it calls for an emperor. In these days, it simply doesn't do for an emperor to send a general. The problem is when the emperor does not go himself, but sends a general to conduct the campaign, and that general is successful. His troops proclaim him emperor, even against his will, perhaps. And then there's infighting and civil war. Troops are stripped from the frontier. That encourages further attacks from the barbarians, and the whole thing starts again. Perhaps an emperor will arise soon who can stop this, this nonsense, but I uh, don't see anything um, changing in the, in the moment. But Diocletian will come around in 284 and put a stop to it. But in the East, there are repeated Roman battles with the Sassanid Persians. Uh, they are a lively bunch, these Persians and constantly are waging war against Rome on the eastern frontier. In the north beyond the Rhine and the Danube, Roman trade and diplomacy have encouraged the formation of large and dangerous barbarian confederations, including the Franks, the Goths, and the Alemanni. Uh, one day that will become uh, the French word for German, Alemania. But anyway, we get ahead of ourselves. So that's what's happening on the international front. Very exciting to, uh, to read of some of the discoveries in medicine. Uh, there is a uh, fellow whose um, work has become quite popular. His name is uh, Galen. Uh, he's been doing a lot of dissection and experimentation on lower animals, uh, on African monkeys, pigs, sheep, and goats. Hard uh, dissection is 
of human beings is so frowned on and, and well, could get one in much trouble with the authorities. But uh, he has been working on animals and has improved immensely his surgical skill and well as well as his uh, knowledge, which he has shared with the world. He's um, a bit of a self-promoter. But there is no doubt that uh, Caleb is uh, an accurate observer. In fact, he has distinguished seven pairs of cranial nerves. He's described the valves of the heart and observed the structural differences between arteries and veins. One of his most important demonstrations, and I was shocked to learn of this, and you may be shocked as well, arteries carry blood not air. We all thought that arteries carried air, but apparently they carry blood. But be that as it may, Galen has shown us that there are three connected systems, the brain and the nerves, which are responsible for sensation and thought, the heart and the arteries, responsible for life-giving energy, and uh, the, the liver, uh, which is... Um, responsible for nutrition. So, as exciting as these discoveries are, what's most important is that Galen has affirmed great scientific truths, namely that human health requires an equilibrium between the four main bodily fluids, the humors. There must be balance between the blood, the yellow bile, the black bile and the phlegm. We've known this since the days of uh, uh, Hippocratic observation of, of medical science, but Galen has confirmed this. Each of the humors is built up from the four elements and displays two of four primary qualities, hot, cold, wet, and dry. But here is the difference. Galen has shown us that the humoral imbalances are located in specific organs, not just in the body as a whole. This is so important because it allows doctors to make more precise diagnoses and to prescribe specific remedies to restore the body's balance. If there are any physicians uh, on this call, you certainly know the importance of balancing your humors and keeping your substances in uh, equilibrium. Well, so that's what's happening on uh, in the front of, uh, of, of, of science. But you, my friends, being co-religionists, are, I'm sure, interested in the news as to what has been going on in the Jewish world. Well, undoubtedly, as you read, it's been some 60 or so years since the Sanhedrin moved to Tiberias. In, um, I find these years so baffling, but 193 CE. Uh, it had been in um, Sipori, Sephoris, uh, also here in uh, northern Israel, Galilee, for for 30 years and uh, moved here uh, some 50, a uh, little over 50 years ago. Now, you of course want to know who is the head of the Sanhedrin. Why, it's Rabbi Yehuda Nisiyah. Oh no, not Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince. Uh, that was Rabbi Yehuda Nisiyah's <laughs> grandfather. His son was um, Gamliel the third. And Gamliel III had Rabbi Yehuda Nisiyah, named after his uh, father. So uh, it's confusing, I know, all the Gamliels and Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, but he is the one who is now the head of the Sanhedrin. Now, you may be asking, well, what of Jerusalem? You're in Tiberias. Tiberias is quite nice. As you can see, we have a lot of lakefront property uh, and cool breezes and a lovely, lovely city, um, wonderful restaurants and, um, and 
all sorts of interesting things to do. But of course, Jerusalem is our eternal capital of the heart. Well, you, I am sure, know the story of Rabbi Akiva, who saw the fox coming out of the ruins of the Holy of Holies, and all of his colleagues began to cry. And Rabbi Akiva began to laugh. And when they inquired, Akiva, why do you laugh at this desolate sight? He said, prophecy will come true, for just as it was prophesied that a fox will one day be prowling through the ruins of the Temple Mount. So too, just as that prophecy has come true, one day it shall be restored. Now Akiba um, met his untimely and tragic end. It's been, oh, 115 years since Rabbi Akiva was uh, killed along with other uh, great sages, 10 martyrs in the year uh, 135 of the Common Era. Uh, you may recall that Hadrian, may his bones rot, rebuilt Aelia Capitolina. He rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, but not as a gift to the Jewish people, as a pagan city built for his legionnaires and in his own glory and put a shrine to Jupiter. The very thought makes me shiver. And put a shrine to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. And Jews were prohibited from entering the city on the pain of death. Except for one day a year, Jews were allowed. Do you know what that day was? Uh, to rub salt in the wounds. Tisha B'Av the ninth of Av, the date when the Romans celebrated their destruction of the temple and their devastation of the city. That was the one day a year that they allowed the Jews in. But things have gotten better. Things are looking up. Why, 50 years ago, the emperor Lucius Septimus Severus first began to allow Jews once again to hold public office. And he decreed that they can refrain from the formalities of pledging allegiance to Rome um, if such were contrary to the teachings of Judaism. Now he continued to ban conversion. There was a time when we converted many a people. There was a lot of conversion that we did but it has been banned since the time of Hadrian and still remains so. And then some 30 years ago, <laughs> free Jews, as opposed to slave Jews, Jews can become slaves, unfortunate, but it happens. Free Jews were able to regain the right to full Roman citizenship. And finally, what we all were looking and waiting for, the Emperor Alexander Severus finally, finally granted Jews permission to visit Jerusalem. Oh, 20 or so years ago. Our great sages have preserved the laws of sacrifice and the blueprints for the temple's rebuilding. Perhaps with all of this good news, maybe, maybe, one day the temple shall be rebuilt. May it soon be an hour day. It's been a very long time. Why, it's been almost 200 years since our temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Almost 200 years. It's unfathomable that our people have gone so long without a temple. The Sanhedrin still calculates the months and declares them individually. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is uh, celebrated now two days throughout Israel. The process of the Sanhedrin waiting for the witnesses to come, that ancient practice that goes back to the days when the Sanhedrin was in Jerusalem, why that still continues. 
the witnesses must come to Tiberius with news of having seen the first sliver of the new moon during the daytime, and they are examined by the members of the Sanhedrin as in days of old. And if they are satisfied that each witness independently verifies what the other has testified to, the Sanhedrin declares that day Rosh Chodesh. The thing is, of course, that Rosh Hashanah falling on the first of Tishrei is, well, very hard to get the word out. Once upon a time, some of the peoples of the land liked to confuse our ancestors by sending signal fires at the wrong time from hill to hill and people became very confused. Now that's a thing of the past, but but still they have to await word and even the swiftest of messengers on horse can only deliver word uh, so quickly. So both outside the land of Israel and even here in the land of Israel, it has become the custom of observing uh, Rosh Hashanah for, for two days. Now, the shofar is blown. The Torah tells us that this is a day of trua, a day of remembrance of the shofar blasts. And indeed, we blow the shofar. We used to blow the shofar early in the morning. Was not a very good idea because the Romans heard the shofar blasts and immediately said to themselves, aha, the Jews are revolting. We had some close calls. And so the Sanhedrin in convocation decided that the shofar blasts would be sounded for the most part during the Musaf service. Uh, surely you recall that after the temple was destroyed and we could no longer bring sacrifices, the rabbis fixed the daily prayers to correspond to the time of the various sacrifices. And so um, we blow the shofar as part of those, those prayers. Uh, they're relatively short. They are, there are some parts of the prayer service that are uh, fairly fixed. Keep in mind that um, no one has um, scrolls. Um, everything is done from memory. So the uh, prayer leader knows the basic rubric of, 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 of the words and uh, is able to lead us. Uh, he does the prescribed liturgical sections. There are places where perhaps he will ad lib. Um, there are those who suggest that we should have lots of poems, uh, liturgical poems that could be a part of the service. Many others don't like the idea at all as if you can improve upon something that has been um, a, a tradition for so many uh, years and, and generations. And so the debate goes on. I imagine somewhere at some time, uh, somebody will get it into his head to begin writing these poems. But um, as yet, no one has really um, dared to take that radical step. So yes, we blow the shofar. We believe that this time of year is a time for uh, humanity being judged and that um, uh, our our fate for the year to come is in God's hands. Well, what else can I tell you? Oh, forgive me. The most important thing, the Mishnah. How could I forget the Mishnah? What a treasure. Six orders and 63 tractates. Ah, there is truly a culture of learning in ancient Israel. And even here today, we are the heirs of what the Sanhedrin has, uh, has first bequeathed to us. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, his memory be for a blessing, 
uh, who's been gone now oh, 40 plus years. It was he who finished the process of editing the Mishnah. And it was arranged in a beautiful way, very logical. Six orders, each one on a large uh, structure, large topic. There is one order about agricultural law, Zra'im. Another about all of the religious appointed times, Moed. And then there is an order of the Mishnah that has to do with all of the laws pertaining to marriage and everything involving uh, the writing of two boats and Leverite marriage and the suspected adulterer and, and divorce and uh, it called Mashim, the women. And then there is Nizikin, all of the civil laws, the tort law, damages. And then there is Kodashim, which contains everything to do with laws of sacrifice, the various blueprints of the dimensions of the temple. Very important for us to preserve this knowledge. We will have to call on it, we believe. And then Taharot, all of the various laws of purity and impurity. And within each superstructure, each order, individual thematic tractates organized by chapter and by section. This was not just the work of Rabbi Uda Nasi. No, it began with Rabbi Akiva and with uh, Rabbi Meir, his student. So really the work of, uh, of a century. And the Mishnah brings together all of these various oral laws that many say go back to Moses on Sinai. And so all of these discussions and these uh, rulings and these opinions, because uh, we Jews are um, a very democratic people in our own way. We believe in the value of debate. And even when an opinion is not followed, it is preserved. We do not seek to, to uh, wipe away those with whom we disagree or those uh, whose uh, views are not adopted. On the contrary, uh, we preserve them. It is said that uh, the views of Hillel and Shammai are both the words of the living God. That might be a good thing perhaps for future generations to remember should they ever get into an era of hyper-partisanship. Remember that part of what it is to live in peace and harmony is to live with civil discourse and the ability to listen to other people's ideas and to disagree with respect. But, but I digress. So the Mishnah has not only crystallized all of these oral laws, and mind you, there were those who did not want the Mishnah to be written down, who said, the moment you write it down, it will begin to become stultifying. No one will want to discuss anything anymore or build on it. They will say, no, no, no. This is how it is. But it had to be written down because the conversations became so complex and there was increasingly more and more and more to remember as each generation added its own understanding. And I suspect that Jews will not stop discussing and debating and arguing that it will not end with the Mishnah. Just a hunch I have, I could be wrong, but I have a hunch that Jews will continue to build on the structure of what has come before. Well, all of this is happening here in Eretz Yisrael, but there are good things coming out of Babylonia, even though Babylonia belongs to the Persians and there are constantly wars between the two. Uh, we can go back and forth uh, with reasonable ease. And um, I just heard recently that a Rav 
one of the students, one of the great and brilliant students of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, has established an academy in Babylonia, in Surah. Jewish life is flourishing in Babylonia. Well, what else can I tell you? What? Oh, you're interested in knowing about the Christians? Huh. Well, they're all Gentiles now. They're uh, the, uh, we, we had some disagreements, to be sure. Uh, but Christians have gone their own way, and um, there, there are no more Jews among the, the Christians. Uh, they are all Greeks and former pagans. Uh, um, I, I cannot say I know much of or understand much of their beliefs, and apparently there are all sorts of different doctrines and claims and counterclaims. I've heard it said that there are bishops in various cities in Rome and Antioch and Byzantium and Alexandria. Uh, Christians have uh, made it as far as Gaul and Carthage. They are indeed um, uh, quite widespread. Um, there are uh, fathers of the church in Rome and in, 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 uh, in Greece. They're called Latin fathers, Greek fathers. Uh, they're fellows named Tertullian and Irenaeus. I, I, you know, again, I, I really do not know much. But I did recently hear of an edict by the new emperor, uh, Decius. Um, he has ordered everyone, except Jews, interesting, who are exempted to perform a sacrifice to the Roman gods and the well-being of the emperor. Uh, just to show you that right now we are actually uh, quite well tolerated that we have been uh, formally exempted from this requirement. But everyone else um, has to uh, bring sacrifice to the Roman gods in uh, the emperor's uh, honor. And the sacrifice has to be performed in the presence of a Roman magistrate and be confirmed and signed and witnessed by the magistrate. Now, Christians have not been exempted from this. Apparently, Rome does not consider them to be a religion. Of course, Christians, because of their claim of monotheistic belief, although I don't understand this father, son, and Holy Ghost, but um, because of their uh, monotheistic beliefs, they are not permitted to bring a sacrifice to pagan gods. So they must choose between their religious beliefs and following the law. As far as I know, this is the first time it has occurred. There have been uh, those among these Christians who have been executed or who have died in prison for refusing to perform the sacrifices. Others have gone into hiding. Uh, many have apostatized and performed uh, these pagan ceremonies. I have heard this has caused great bitterness in the Christian community between those who have performed the sacrifices and those who have not. I cannot say I have much sympathy for this religion uh, who follows that uh, that discredited prophet um, Yeshu but but still when I think of the persecutions we have suffered for remaining true to our beliefs I cannot help but feel pity for these poor people well that is the news as far as I know um, pray tell perhaps you have uh, some, some questions that I could try to answer. I am by no means uh, an expert in, in, in all things. Uh, I am just a poor student of the rabbis, uh, a, uh, a, a tinsmith here in uh, Tiberias in the marketplace. So I try to make time to study Torah very important for those who would be a rabbi to have a, an occupation. Um, certainly you can't support your family being a rabbi. You must have a, uh, 
you must have something to uh, some sort of trade or business. Uh, but 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 enough uh, from me. I have talked too long. Um, are there any questions that uh, that you might have about uh, life in in Tiberias here at this time? And and feel free to to uh, not be mute. <laughs> <laughs> No questions? What did the community think when Herod became king? Or... Oh, that's a long time before 250 CE. So Herod became oh, king. Oh, right, uh, right, 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 right. Okay. But I mean, uh, you know, um, I can tell you what happened in my great, great, great grandfather's time. Um, Herod was not uh, particular popular. Right. Uh, he, uh, first of all, he was, he was not the nicest guy. He killed his wife and his children because he suspected that they had Maccabean blood. He himself was actually a descendant of converts. Uh, he was an Idumean, and uh, the Idumeans were forcibly converted to Judaism by the Hasmoneans, by the Maccabees. Um, so he was rather paranoid. Um, he was a good maneuverer. Uh, the only time he made a mistake was um, in uh, betting on um, Antony and Cleopatra. Um, uh, but, but he recovered from that as well. He was a great builder, an amazing builder. Um, if you uh, visit the Herodian, which is now in the West Bank, but it's, uh, it's an amazing fortress near, near Bethlehem. I know. Sada. Uh, Caesarea, he, he built uh, that as a port city. Uh, I mean, from scratch, uh, it, you know, in, in honor of the Romans. It was not, not a Jewish city at all. So that was the thing is that he had no problem building uh, pagan temples. Um, but his most uh, enduring uh, at work that actually took another uh, 40 years was the temple. He did huge renovations. And if you look at the at the Kotel, you're looking at least in the lower sections at Herod's work. When you go on the tunnel tour, you're definitely looking at Herod's work. One of the most amazing things is to look at the lower part of the wall and see how incredibly regular and smooth the these massive multi-ton slabs of stone are. And then if you look up the wall, which was built much later, uh, some um, not until uh, the time of the, uh, of the Ottomans, uh, it's, it looks really sloppy. So Herod was uh, quite, a, quite a builder, but, um, but not a nice guy. Jews didn't particularly love him um, so much. Although they admitted that he was a great builder and, you know, the temple was, you know, one of those big projects, which he undertook because he wanted popularity. Plus, he, he liked impressive buildings. Um, other questions? About? So, uh, Rosh Hashanah in the year 250, I mean, he had the shofar. You had some of the basic outline of the liturgy, um, the Amidah prayer, certainly the actual brachot, the ending pieces of uh, each of the special brachot for Rosh Hashanah. Uh, you didn't have any of the liturgical poetry, any of the PU team. Um, other customs of Rosh Hashanah didn't exist. Um, there was Kiddush. People did make Kiddush. Uh, no apple and honey, <laughs> and no Rosh Hashanah cards. Uh, no Tashlech either. Tashlech did not exist. Hadn't been thought of. We'll we'll get to that in due time. 
So, so we don't know how when Tosh how Toshlik was created at this time. Oh, we do, we do, <laughs> but we'll have to. We gotta wait. You gotta get in the time machine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have another uh, 1,200 years to go before Tashla. <laughs> Rabbi, what caused the creation of Rosh Hashanah then? Well, it's in the, it's in the Torah, although it wasn't identified as, uh, you know, as, as a quote-unquote new year. It was just a day of sounding um, the shofar, um, just the first day of the seventh month. Um, it, it's... It clearly, it, it clearly was connected to Yom Kippur because you didn't put uh, these holidays, all these Tishrei holidays together without some, um, without some connection. Although what that connection is, the Torah does not make so very clear. Uh, Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. Um, Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret is a, a harvest hosp, uh, harvest festival. Um, well, then in getting prepared for Yom Kippur, there, there, it was a, a preparation time. And that was well, the and, and it was also when you declared the Jubilee year. So the sabbatical years began, you know, around the time of the, right after the harvest was over. Um, now, there was a tradition that uh, King David was uh, crowned on um, at the beginning of Tishrei. Yes, he's not. Hmm? King Go David. Ahead. Yeah, David. And uh, it's, there's nowhere in the Torah that gives us a date. But um, that theme of coronation, right? Rosh Hashanah is actually a date of coronation of God. Um, so... That ancient tradition was that, you know, well, time of celebrating coronation, um, even though um, the, uh, the, the, the actual years of kings uh, began with the first of, of, of Nisan. Um, it really wouldn't be until the rabbinic period that um, that this idea of Rosh Hashanah, uh, that even the term Rosh Hashanah is used, um, and that it you know that it represents a new year. Keep in mind that for Jews there are multiple new years. I mean there are multiple new years for Americans. We have fiscal year. Um, so the first day of the school year is in January one. Um, Fiscal years are often, right, they're uh, July 1, right? fiscal year and June 30th. So, um, so in just the same way, the Jewish calendar had uh, uh, different years for, for different purposes. To be Shvat is the quote-unquote new year for the trees, and that's the 15th of Shvat in the, in the late winter. Uh, but this idea of Rosh Hashanah being named as such and being a time for judgment of, of people uh, is right out of the Mishnah, the first Mishnah of the first chapter of the tractate Rosh Hashanah. So that was already there in the year 250 CE. That was already there and that idea already existed. And then in the, in, the, in the ensuing centuries, the Talmud would build even more on that. Um, right? Three books, the, the Book of Life, the Book of, uh, you get Schmeist, and then the middle book where everybody goes and, you know, and you, you, uh, you don't know which way you're going and, um, uh, until, well, until you find out, but um, the idea that, you know, active tshuva and prayer and staka and repentance, all of that can change your, your destiny. Um, you begin to see that in the Gemara and the Talmud. Uh, it does not in the Mishnah, but, but embryonically, the idea is there. Other thoughts? So we're building on, we're building on on rabbis from 
vador vador, from generation to generation, they're adding something new for us to uh, face where we are now. But as, as it has evolved, you're telling us. So that- Well, the, the Judaism that we practice today is rabbinic. Um, you know, the, the foundation is, is the Torah and the Bible. Um, you know, it, it all goes back to that. But our, our understanding, the Judaism that we recognize today as Judaism is rabbinic Judaism, for sure. As created by the rabbis. It's the Mishnah. Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, they, they certainly were the heirs of received tradition. So they, and they believed that they were empowered as the heirs to these received traditions. Um, that they, that what they were doing was in quote unquote making things up, but that they were engaging in a sanction process and what they were doing was, was you know, building, connecting the dots. <laughs> um, the dots were already there, they were just connecting them. And we know that that's, you know, not strictly 100% of the picture, right? They were both connecting dots as well as penciling some dots in. Um, but they certainly believe that that was their role. And there are places in the Torah, this week's Torah portion is a great place to point that, you know, when you have questions about how, what to do and how to do it, you go to... The, the, the judges uh, and the authorities in your day, and I'm at the Torah, empowers the judges and authorities of each generation uh, to function on behalf of that generation. Rabbis took that seriously. So they were, um, were they innovators? Yes. But they were also interpreters of, of traditions that were already there, at least embryonically. And they were very, very close readers of the text. So they didn't just, you know, um, it wasn't just eating, meeny, money, mo. Um, they really looked for uh, sanction in the text that was important to them. Sometimes what they were basing their arguments on were, were very, very, very thin, um, not smoking guns. But but they were aware of that too. So it's it's a it's a it's a complicated uh, it's a complicated picture. But in any event, they certainly they they built a structure on top of that foundation, and you know, we we live on the floors on top of that structure, for sure. I had a professor in college who said that. Um, Biblical Judaism had two children. One was called Christianity, and the other was called Rabbinic Judaism. Right, because um, Christians certainly look to uh, the Hebrew Bible, albeit in a very, very different way for different purposes. Um, but you know, they can they can trace their roots back to uh, the Hebrew Bible as well, and in some cases to rabbinic traditions. Um, um, but anyway, so our next stop uh, will be um, in the year 1240, Rosh Hashanah, um, in the year 1240 in Paris, where, um, so you probably wouldn't have wanted to visit Paris in 1240. <laughs> It was a, probably a, <laughs> probably a pretty a pretty um, dirty dirty and and um, uh, smelly place, um, but we will arrive just in time. No one, it's a spoiler, but uh, for for the Talmud to be burnt. And, uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, to see some. Um, some uh, controversies over Maimonides. He's a pretty controversial figure um, in the latter part of his life and after his death.
Uh, but uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll meet up in 13th century Paris um, just before Rosh Hashanah and uh, find out what's, um, what's going on. See if my friend uh, Modo is there. Um, he's not always available. He's quasi available. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so. <Aww>. Sorry. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> anyway, so. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, um, and if any any uh, feedback, I, I thought it might be kind of fun to talk like, you know, in the first person. Um, but if you find it too discombobulating, I it's just very, thought it was- very entertaining. We enjoy so, it. so I have a question for the first person. So I, I hear a lot about the plague of Cyprian is, uh, is rolling through our, our, our area. And I've even heard some refer to it as, uh, as the plague of, uh, of Africa, plague even of, uh, the Ethiopian Africa. plague. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, uh, about the plague going through our region right now. <laughs> Ah, well, um, he looked it up on Google, so you know. Well, so <laughs> Google, yes. Yeah. Google. <laughs> well, you know, whew, I have to hand it to you. We'll hand it to you. Um, yes, well, plagues, um, what we would have done back then, um, we would have declared a fast. And um, there, there's in the tractate Tanit and in, in the Mishnah, there's a whole series of incremental things that you do. Uh, we would have brought the ark out into the street and all put ashes on our head. And we would have found um, somebody who uh, was um, capable of leading the uh, the prayers of the broken heart, um, preferably somebody whose livelihood was being threatened by the plague or, or by the drought. Drought was a really a, one of the primary reasons that, um, that we would have these petitionary prayers and fasts. Um, and that may be the problem is that we haven't had enough uh, fasts and petitionary Fasting. prayers. And that prayer. May be, that may be the problem. Um, We're all praying, but I don't think a lot of people are fasting. <laughs> well, I think people are gaining weight, if anything. What can I tell you? And I've learned not to, um, you know, not to say anything about the emperor. <laughs> you know, I keep him in mind that he exempted Jews from performing this sacrifice to pagan gods. So, um, you got to stay on the emperor's good side. <laughs> All righty. Steven. Yes, sir. Yeah, coming back to Alpha Centauri, up until 1995, <laughs> we weren't aware of any stars outside of our system. And about four years ago, they discovered that there are planets around that star, Alpha Centauri. Remember. And one of the planets is in what they call the Goldilocks region. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, so life could exist. So getting back to your comment last uh, week, it's quite possible that you and I were on Alpha Centauri together, that you were my rabbi because you look very familiar. It's possible. <laughs> you know, um... Way out in the Milky Way, uh, the, the Hubble just saw this for the first time a few years ago, is that there's something called the Borscht Belt. And uh, <laughs> they have, uh, oh, they have uh, various, uh, you know, various, they're more like asteroids floating around out there. There's the Grossinger's asteroid and the Concord asteroid and the Nevely and, um, um, Butchers. Uh, I think there there were a few others. Oh, Homowak, Tamowak, Tamarack, not Tamowak, Tamarack. Um, Browns. Which one? Oh, Browns. Yes, Browns. Browner 
Uh, yeah, Browns was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I remember seeing the ads on uh, driving up on Route 17 uh, as a kid. Oh, is that, oh, oh, Marco, you, you got to, you got to, Marco has a comment. Um, Herod was a builder and not a nice guy. Anyone like that nowadays? Um, I will leave that for, for you to... Uh, <laughs> you know, he did start a casino, Herod's. <laughs> I don't know, if, you know how well it did. Uh, Herod's, uh, it might have gone belly up, at least the Atlantic City uh, Herod's, but... Um, but anyhow, so, um, yeah, you, you, you uh, I can't get into trouble, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll fast forward to 1240 and, uh, I hope everybody has a great week. Um, just to, uh, a couple of plugs and promos, um, you should be getting more information the week ahead about high holidays. Uh, there will be um, our Elul Brigade uh, on Friday, which is Rosh Chodesh Elul. And on Sunday, folks can um, come by for a shofar blowing. We will have um, you know, sort of a drive-through. Uh, clergy and staff will be out and um, you get to hear the shofar we have a bag of little treats for you um, some apple or at least apple notepads <laughs> um, and some honey sticks and uh, just a nice way to start Elul and then for those who uh, obviously will be a lot of folks who can't uh, make it for whatever reason we'll start uh, making these deliveries during um, the week uh, ahead. So that is uh, Friday from 12 to 2 and then Sunday, I want to say 10 to 12, I'm not sure. Uh, but there should be a uh, word that goes out. And then um, a little bit further down in the month, uh, our Slichot service this year, uh, we're doing something completely unprecedented. It is the first movement-wide Slichot service. It will start here on the East Coast at um, uh, a little after 8 p.m. and um, offer a total of seven hours of programming um, so that it goes all the way through midnight uh, in, um, you know, on the Pacific coast. And there will be 60 rabbis and cantors um, leading different kinds of programming, study programming, study music. Um, I'm doing a bibliodrama. Um, I believe Chazan is doing something musical. Uh, but um, this year... Uh, we won't be joining the temple, sadly. I mean, uh, uh, we've been doing that now almost a dozen years, but um, it just the logistics were way too hard. So uh, we are going to be part of this um, hundreds of congregations um, and we'll be connecting with rabbis, cantors, and other people. And... Um, it is an experiment, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So, so just uh, keep that in mind. And there'll be uh, other stuff coming out uh, during the month ahead, um, video messages. If any of you would like to, uh, to send a video greeting to the congregation, we're talking a minute or two. That's with a thought, a Shana Tova and, you know, what the... Uh, you know, what 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 you're thinking about or what you would like just just um you can let me know you can let um jennifer smith know but our hope is to have lots of those whenever we have a uh you know information we're sending the congregation